Hey guys, this is our first video in the new unit looking at uh, the United States during the interwar period, that is the time period between 1918 and 1939, between World War One and World War II. And what we're going to be looking at in this video is we're going to be looking at some cultural responses to the Progressive Era and to World War I. Uh, basically, a lot of people in the United States were uncomfortable with all of the changes that happened during the Progressive Era. And a lot of them wanted to pass laws or change America in some way to take it back to its earlier values and its earlier roots. So this is a uh, kind of a conservative response, and we're going to look more specifically at, at what exactly they do. Here are your goals. You'll notice there's a bunch of them today. As I already said, the time period from 1900 to 1920 was a period of very big changes. And we're just going to review some of those changes real quick so we can understand why it was that so many Americans uh, wanted to sort of bring things back. What had changed over this 20 year period? First, immigration had been a major fact of life during this time period. Immigration levels from 1900 to 1920 were the highest ever in American history. Millions and millions of people were streaming into the country during this time period. And uh, this was changing the culture of the United States. The United States was originally a nation uh, kind of controlled by people from Western Europe, from England, and then later from Ireland and Germany. And now people both from Asia and even more so from Southern and Eastern Europe were coming in and changing the culture. And some people were not comfortable with that. Another thing that was going on is that the government was expanding its control. We saw this under Teddy Roosevelt and under Woodrow Wilson, uh, sort of making the government more powerful to control businesses and to try and help the average person. Uh, we saw this with the Meat Inspection Act, where President Roosevelt basically says the government gets to go in and say whether or not a company is making clean, pure meat or not. That's just one of many examples of expanding government power. Another big change was America's involvement in World War I. This was the first major foreign war that the United States had gotten involved in, and a lot of Americans died or were wounded in it, and it was very expensive. And this war was really a terrible war. You can see in that picture there, those are American soldiers who have been blinded by poisonous gas, which is a pretty awful fate. They're linked up in a chain following each other around because they can't see where they're going. Uh, and a lot of people thought that this wasn't worth it, that this was a stupid war, that America didn't get anything out of it, and wanted to sort of pull back and just worry about America rather than what was going on on the other side of the ocean. Uh, the Great Migration happened during this time period and was continuing uh, after 1920. And what this meant is that for the first time in American history, there were very large populations of African Americans in northern cities. And this was changing the culture of these northern cities. Uh, we saw the rise of jazz and of new poetic and artistic forms in the cultural or in the uh, Harlem Renaissance. And jazz especially became incredibly popular. But a lot of people, especially uh, white Protestant Americans, were uncomfortable with these cultural changes. They thought that jazz in particular was kind of a not such a great movement. Uh, maybe in the way that some, some old people today kind of look down on hip hop or uh, stuff like that. They don't think it's a real musical uh, movement. And uh, last of all, we saw the uh, out the occurrence of women's suffrage, and also a lot of social changes about how women acted in public. We see there a, uh, a painting of a, a flapper wearing sort of a loose-fitting dress, out having a good time all by herself, sort of a strong, independent woman. So the 
roles for what women were allowed to do in society were changing very rapidly, and some people were not very comfortable with this. And uh, so what we're going to look at today is how this group of Americans reacted to all of these changes. And the people that were most upset about these changes were people who tended to live in rural America. They tended to be white and they tended to be Protestant Christians. And basically, these were the people who used to be basically in charge of the United States. Uh, the people who came over from Great Britain a long time ago and sort of decided how things would work. And they basically imagined a beautiful, peaceful America a long time ago, and they kind of wanted to restore America to that. Uh, they wanted to stay out of future wars, they wanted to stop immigration, they wanted to ban alcohol, they wanted to ban evolution in schools, and all sorts of other stuff. So we're going to look at some of the stuff that this group calls for, and in fact ends up getting right uh, during the 1920s. So one of the leaders of this group, uh, this like desire to return back to a, a better time in the past, is uh, the President Warren G. Harding. Uh, and basically, Warren G. Harding is kind of the opposite of Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was a, a progressive thinker, and he argued that America needed to sort of step up into a leadership role in the world. And that basically America needed to be just and progressive at home and also to fight for justice and progress in other countries. And that is why Woodrow Wilson said that the United States entered World War I was in order to make the world safe for democracy. He also wanted to join the League of Nations and he wanted the United States to lead the world towards a better future. A lot of Americans disagreed with this, and Warren G. Harding was one of them. Harding was only president for a couple years, uh, but he had a big impact. His idea, his, his slogan was a return to normalcy. That is, he wanted to make America normal again. And rather than focusing on progress or big ideas, he instead focused on just sort of growing the U.S. Uh, economy. He cut taxes for the rich, he cut taxes for big business, uh, which were put in place under Woodrow Wilson, the, the income tax. He also demanded that France and Britain pay back all of their loans, even though France and Britain were hurting pretty bad after the war. He also called for isolationism, basically that the United States didn't have any uh, need to help other countries, and it didn't need other countries to help it that the United States should just do its own thing all by itself and not worry about other countries. Uh, this is going all the way back to an idea put forward by George Washington, basically that the United States shouldn't worry about other countries, just worry about itself. Um, so he ignores what other countries ask of the United States, and he also refuses to join the League of Nations, even though it was the previous president, Wilson, who proposed the League of Nations just a couple years before. Another major change that happens during the 1920s is the uh, enactment of prohibition. Prohibition is uh, usually means the banning of production and sale of alcohol. Now, actually, you can prohibit anything. So there, you could there could be prohibition on um, there could be prohibition on cigarettes. There could be prohibition on on uh, driving big trucks. You could prohibit anything. But when people use prohibition, they usually are talking about this time period in the United States where alcohol was made illegal. And prohibition began in the United States in 1919 when the 18th Amendment was passed. We actually amended our Constitution to make alcohol illegal. And what this meant in practice was that any drink that contained more than one half of one percent alcohol was now illegal. And a lot of Americans supported this, which is what you need if you're going to amend the Constitution. And there were some very, there were some strange reasons for why Americans supported this. One was racism. A lot of 
Americans uh, were not happy about immigration. And immigrant groups, especially from Southern and Eastern Europe, tended to bring their own types of alcohol and their own traditions surrounding alcohol with them. So for example, uh, Germans brought beer to America. Uh, in fact, the word beer is originally a German word. The Irish brought whiskey. Italians would drink wine. Uh, Jewish immigrants, wine was very important for them as well. And uh, basically, in big cities, these immigrant groups tended to drink a lot of alcohol. And, uh, you know, Western European uh Americans, Americans who had been living in the United States for a very long time, didn't really like this, didn't really like these immigrants, and were wanted to sort of uh, take that away. Also, um, religion was a reason for this. Uh, among Protestant Christians, that is Christians from, usually from uh, Northern and Western Europe, thought that drinking was sinful, that basically drinking made you do stuff that was not particularly good, that you should probably be in church on the weekend, not hanging out in a bar. And also, the increasing role of women in politics helped to lead to prohibition as well. Women argued that alcohol hurt families because men, instead of going home to hang out with their families after they got off work, would instead go to a local bar and hang out and drink in the bar and spend all their money on beer or whatever instead of hanging out with their family. So uh, all three of these factors combine to lead to widespread support for prohibition. And prohibition has some pretty nasty effects. Uh, on, the, on the plus side, Alcohol consumption does go down. Americans in 1919 were drinking a lot of alcohol. And by making alcohol illegal, drinking declined by about 30%. Uh, so you'll notice it doesn't decline 100%. That means Americans are still drinking 60% of all the alcohol they were drinking before. So that means that a lot of people are now breaking the law. And so not surprisingly, this leads to increasing crime in the United States. If you look at a graph, which I don't have here, but we'll look at it in class, crime rates uh, in the United States skyrocket after 1919. And it's largely because of prohibition. And what this does is that making alcohol illegal creates a black market. Basically, honest people can no longer sell alcohol because it's against the law. So if you want to... Uh, that means that other people can move in on the market and people can make a lot of money by secretly selling alcohol uh, when nobody's looking. And we see a, a, a array of new types of criminals appear in the United States. There are smugglers who illegally import alcohol from Canada or from other countries. There are moonshiners. These are people who hang out in uh, sort of secluded areas, especially up in the mountains, uh, like in North Carolina and Kentucky and Tennessee and make their own alcohol out in the woods. Uh, they make this special kind of alcohol called moonshine, which is like uh, sort of, I don't know, like primitive whiskey. And last of all, and maybe most importantly, uh, you see the rise of organized crime. There are, there are a huge amount of money to be made selling alcohol to the 60% of people who are still drinking. And uh, different gangs compete for control of this market. Because if you can dominate the market to sell alcohol, you can make a lot of money. And most famously, we see the rise of the Mafia, which is a Italian-American uh, crime organization that is able to corner the markets for alcohol in big cities like Chicago and New York, and then use that money to build up their organization and to compete with the police. In fact, they made so much money that a lot of times the mafia had better weapons than the police who were trying to stop them. As you can see there, that, um, that uh, member of the mafia is equipped with a Tommy gun, which is one of the earliest uh, sort of automatic weapons that you could, you could get. And he's got like a, like a 50 round barrel attached to that, uh, or like, clip magazine 
attached to that uh, gun. So that guy could do some damage, and if the police try to stop him, well, good luck. And so anyway, what you see is that the murder rate during this time period goes up by 78%. So drinking goes down by 30%, but the people who are being killed in the United States go goes up by almost 80%. So the question you got to ask is, was it worth it? Also, on top of all that, uh, the government has to spend more money trying to crack down on alcohol. Um, it's very hard to catch everybody who's trying to sell alcohol in the United States. And even though the United States spends millions of dollars paying police officers and enforcement agents to go around trying to stop alcohol production and sale, uh, they're not particularly successful. Another thing that you see during this time period is a sort of uh, nationalistic, maybe even uh, xenophobic uh, wave wash over white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America. Uh, so Anglo-Saxon means that you are originally from England, that's where your family is from, and this is where some of the oldest families in the United States come from, because remember, uh, the United States starts out as a English colony. And uh, so this group of people, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, are really scared about certain changes that are going on in the United States. One is there is a growing fear of communists in the United States. Russia, by this point, is now a communist nation, and a lot of Americans are worried that immigrants are going to bring communist ideas into the United States and overthrow the government. Also, uh, partially related to this Red Scare, we see the rise of the KKK. So we already talked about this. Um, it starts actually in 1915 with the movie Birth of a Nation. Uh, it's the second version of the KKK. And this version is weird because it's the first version was sort of this secret terrorist organization in the South trying to fight against Reconstruction. This version of the KKK is a a sort of open mass movement. People all over the country, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, join this movement and are sort of proud members of the KKK. Uh, and basically they only accept white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and hate every other group. They, they dislike non-whites, they dislike Catholics, which includes a lot of Italians and Irish people, they dislike Jews, who make up a lot of the Eastern European immigrants. They hate communists. They oppose birth control. And they oppose alcohol. And they basically argued that America was created by white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and that basically those pe only white Anglo-Saxon Protestants should be allowed to live in the United States. It's people like this who also end up getting upset about science being taught in schools. Uh, because these, this group, these groups are very religious and deeply uh, Protestant, they think that, that certain new ideas, especially Charles Darwin's idea of evolution, will lead people to become atheists. Because according to evolution, uh, God did not create the world, God did not create man, but rather uh, man evolved as a result of natural scientific processes. Um, so anyway, in Tennessee, religious fundamentalists pass a law making it illegal to teach evolution in school. But a high school science teacher named John Scopes decides to teach evolution anyway. As, as a result of this, he is put on trial and found guilty of breaking the law. And uh, this, this case garners national attention. Uh, a lot of people think that John Scopes should be punished. A lot of people, though, especially people, progressives who support science and stuff like that, think that this is crazy that a man is being punished for teaching what is scientific fact. Uh, so all of this together shows that there's a big sort of uh, cultural backlash among white Anglo-Saxon America. And one last big thing that comes out of all of this is a, sort of a major shift in the United States, which is the ending of mass immigration. For almost all of American history, immigration was a very, very big part 
of our country and a major reason that America grew to be so big and powerful. Um, and this comes to an end in 1921 when the United States passes something called the Quota Act of 1921. And what this does is that restricts immigration from uh, of each nationality based on the number of people of that nationality already living in the United States. So basically what that means is that uh, if there's a small minority group from Romania, not very many Romanians will be allowed to enter in the United States in the future. But uh, for larger groups like people from England or Ireland or Germany, more people from those countries will be allowed in. So it's basically a way for the United States to um, to make sure that only certain types of people, only cert people from certain countries can come in. So it's, it's once again an expression of sort of like cultural fear and uh, maybe even xenophobia. White Anglo-Saxon Protestants only want other white Anglo-Saxon Protestants coming in to the country. So people from Italy, people from Eastern Europe, people from Asia or Africa are going to find it way, way harder to get into the United States than before. Um, and this is made even uh, more the case by the Immigration Act of 1924, which reduces the quotas from 3% to 2% um, and really forces immigration in to become merely a trickle of what it was. So if you look at the difference between 1914 and 1924, uh, immigration declines by a whole lot. Almost a million people, 900,000 people, came into the United States in 1914. In 1924, only 160,000 people came in. So that that is a, a major decrease, um, almost like a 70% decrease in immigration in just 10 years. Okay, guys, so those are some of the big uh, cultural responses to the progressive era. Uh, prohibition, uh, the Red Scare, the rise of the KKK, and the ending of immigration. So all of this was to try and make America quote-unquote normal again. And uh, so we'll, uh, we'll talk about this all next week. We'll focus especially on prohibition and how that all worked out. Um, but so anyway, yeah, make sure you can answer these questions. Make sure you know what that vocabulary is talking about. And I will uh, see you guys on Monday.